Hey friends, welcome back to the Old Fashioned On Purpose podcast. So this season we're talking to some of my favorite authors and we can't talk about books without talking about some of my favorite homesteading books. And I know that I have seen a lot of chicken books come over my desk over the last 10 years or so, but there's one in particular that I recommend and I reach for more than any of the others. And I am so very excited to have the author of that book joining me today. Harvey Ussery is truly a chicken expert and a regenerative, sustainable homesteader himself. He's been published in Backyard Poultry, Mother Earth News, and more. And of course, he is very well known for his book, The Small Scale Poultry Flock. So welcome, Harvey. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. So... I was really excited when I, I think it was your publicist or your publisher reached out and said that you were redoing this landmark book mm. in a second edition. And she asked if I wanted a copy. And of course I was like, absolutely. And then I'm like, what if we had Harvey on the podcast? So that's how this came about. But I know many of my audience have the first edition of your book. Can you real quick, before we get into all the questions, tell them the difference between the two editions and what they can expect? Well, uh, I, in, in the first edition, I tried in every uh, aspect of the discussion to uh, constantly open out uh, the discussion into the big picture, the wider ecology. But I, I tried to, uh, to do that even more, uh, with even more a focus on uh, the, the, the place of poultry husbandry in the bigger picture, the wider ecology, what I call the abundant ecology. And uh, so I, I, I replaced the first chapter entirely to give it this focus. Uh, also, I, um, in the intervening years uh, after the first publication, um, I did a lot more with breeding my own stock. And I introduced into the revision a lot more uh, information about breeding poultry in a more rigorous and systematic way. And uh, I think there's good information to guide uh, people who want to breed their own, even at the, uh, I call it the ambitious uh, homestead or the small farm uh, scale. And um, and another uh, way, um, another way in which uh, I expanded and refined uh, some of the information is with regard to working with natural mothers, uh, broody hens. Um, I, I think there's a lot of interest uh, among owners of flocks uh, in uh, maybe hatching out some chicks with their own hens, um, but a lot of people simply don't know how, how to, to uh, uh, to, to manage that process. And I think, mm, especially the revision of the book presents more, I think, on this subject and more uh, grounded and experienced uh, experience in uh, working with broody hens than probably any other source. That's awesome, because I think, as I'm sure you're well aware, most chicken books just kind of brush over a lot of those topics. It's just, you know, I feel like with any sort of agriculture, there's the conventional way that everyone else does it. And then as homesteaders or, or maybe folks, you know, in that Joel Salatin type camp, it, we're invited to think outside of the box and, and be more in tune with nature. And there's those two uh, different mindsets. And what I love about your chicken book is you address all those questions that I had or the ones that kind of bothered me, but I was kind of told by the conventional train of thought that you just ignored or you just do it this way or is just the way it is. <laughs> And I love that you were like, no, we work with nature. We don't have to depend on bag feeds all the time. We can let the broody hens do their thing. I, I think it's just, it's fascinating. It's a whole new world. And uh, there, there are all, always uh, exciting possibilities if you follow your bird's lead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, one thing I think I noticed in the second edition as I was flipping through it, um, not to get off on a rabbit trail, but you mentioned the Icelandic chickens more. Hmm. And I know that, that those are one of your favorite breeds, if, if I'm correct. Is that right? You do, do a lot with the Icelandic. That is, that is correct. For seven years, I, uh, I kept uh, Icelandic exclusively, and I bred all of my own stock. And that okay. was 
that was that was really uh, one of my peak peak experiences working with a, uh, a small homestead flock. Yeah, which I think is fascinating. I had I, I just have to confess, and I haven't read the, the chapter in the new book yet, but I had Icelandics for a while. If people have listened to this podcast mm. for a, a, any length of time, mm. you might have heard me reference them. I had a hard I had a hard time getting along with them, and I feel like they hated me. Is this normal? <laughs> like they did not want to be my friends. <laughs> Ah, ah, ah. Is, this, is there something wrong uh, with me? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think okay. this is a, a very good point, though, that um, I don't think the people who are listening to us right now are looking for uh, one-size-fits-all uh, solutions or recommendations. Um I, you know, it, finding your own way, uh, that's the way to go. And it's the, it's the exciting way to go, the creative way to go, and the fun way to go. And uh, I have heard from other keepers of Icelandics, uh, their comments about them are uh, all the way across the board, whether or not they're what's called flighty, yeah. uh, whether they can be uh, retained in electric net fencing and, uh, and you know, whether they, they get along readily with people. I found with my Icelandics, uh, that, that we got along great and, uh, they, 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 they were docile when I was, uh, in their hen house. And, uh, no, I, I didn't have, (laughs) have a problem of feeling there wasn't a basic fit there. Okay. And it, I did buy my flock from another keeper at, at, for, as adults. So it's possible that we just never bonded. But I mean, they're beautiful birds. I was really intrigued by their, their history, but it, like they were always flighty. They never got used to me. And they were always like, I don't care what pin or enclosure you put me in. I'm going to leave it because I can fly. So goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I kept my Icelandics and 42 inch high electric net fencing. Oh my goodness. And I didn't I didn't have escapes. The only time that I remember they ever flew over the 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 net was one time a bobcat came around and it got up on a big boulder and was checking them out. He yeah. was looking at the the flock and uh when when uh the guy that works for me told me there's a bobcat out there and I went out there se- I saw that several of the birds had as they never did, uh, had gone over the net because somebody was sure. somebody was wanting to eat them. <laughs> I don't blame them. Don't blame them for that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. But, I might try uh, them again. But, I might try them again. <laughs> and yes, maybe trying them uh, from chicks would, would give you better results. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because I think they're fascinating for sure. And we live in a cold and, climate. And so, another. Yeah. And another uh, thing about an Icelandic flock is that they're they're really not a a, def- a tightly defined breed. They're a land race, and therefore visually they're a kaleidoscope. And yeah. so if I'm only if I'm only going to have one uh, breed of chickens in my backyard, I, a lot of visual diversity. That's a big bonus. Yes, totally. They're, yeah, they're, I couldn't believe the difference I had from bird to bird. It was fantastic. Yeah. Okay. I'm trying them again. I will try them again at some point. I'll report back. We'll see what happens. <laughs> so, um, okay. So now on to my actual questions. I just had to, I just had to ask about that. But um, one aspect I love in your writings is you talk about the connection of the soil with the chickens um, and that idea of the abundant ecology and how everything is working together. And I know f- for myself this summer, I was dealing with a variety of soil concerns or issues. So I've been really honed in on um, soil nutrients and such. So I'd love to talk about this in terms of chickens. I know folks are always kind of singing the praises of chickens and garden soil. Um, but can you explain, I, I think you mentioned in the book how that can sometimes get out of balance or how can we keep that where it needs to be? Can we have too much of a good thing? Yes. Um, and. Uh, I'm glad that I had a chance. You, you know, uh, I Jill, I as a writer uh, on on the subject of poultry, I have all I have never hesitated to admit uh, mistakes I had made and to pass on 
the story of, uh, of mistakes uh, that I had made so it would benefit others and they wouldn't have to make the same mistake. So uh, that is one thing that I uh, did stress in the first edition of the book that even though I had touted the virtues of uh, incorporating the, the flocks droppings, their manure, into the soil as a benefit uh, to the soil, a part of the natural recycling process, all that's great, all that is beautiful, but you can, as you noted, have too much of a good thing. And my, my mother always told me that. I imagine yours did too. And specifically, uh, too much manure of any sort, uh, not only poultry, but other livestock man manures. If you overload the soil with, with those manures, then you can get a, a build, build up of certain mineral salts, especially those of potassium and phosphorus. And again, those are essential uh, soil nutrients. Uh, but too much of them in the mix uh, can cause problems for plant growth. Yes. And is there something that someone can do? Let's say they have added chicken manure um, with a lot of excitement and they've overloaded and they realize they're out of balance. Is there a way they can remedy that at this point? Um. Uh, there, there isn't a quick fix, but uh, but the start on a quick fix is to just uh, stop bringing manures uh, onto that plot of ground. Um, I was uh, generating a lot of poultry manure-based uh, compost mm -hmm. uh, into the garden, but I was also bringing in literally pickup loads of horse manure, I called it pony poop, yep. from a neighbor of mine who uh, boarded and bred horses. And the combination of those, it did lead to uh, an uh, overloading of especially, again, uh, potassium and, and phosphorus over the years. So the first thing was to, uh, to just immediately uh, make sure no more manures came in as fertility. And then over time, uh, if you remove those, um, those some of that uh, mineral fertility in your cropping, the crops you take off of it, the spent plants that you take off and uh, use for mulches and compost elsewhere on the property, um, and the cover crops you, you take and maybe cut them and use them elsewhere on the the landscape over time, you will draw down those excesses, yes. And also good soil testing from time to time is a good idea. Yes. And, you know, you can get a lot of free tests, but uh, you know what they say, uh, you get what you pay for. And so it uh, might be a good idea to find a uh, a soil consultant that you feel you have good reason to trust and to pay yes. for uh, soil testing and consultation. I couldn't agree more. I've learned so much from my soil tests. It's been invaluable, worth every penny. Yes. Um, I was thumbing through the second edition of your book while I was eating lunch today before we got on this call. And I, like I said, I haven't read it in its entirety yet, but I saw a, a portion in there um, then I'm going to going to read the rest of it this afternoon. But you're talking about cover crops and the greenhouse and how you use that in synergy with the chickens, and that fascinates mm -hmm. me. Can you expound on that a little bit more? Specific, spe specifically, the greenhouse model. Yes, the greenhouse model. Yes, um, I, I had a lot of fun with that project, but the uh, the idea was to um, uh, set, set up a uh, couple of chicken pens in the far end of my 48-foot greenhouse. That's a sizable greenhouse for a homestead uh, greenhouse. Uh, but in the far end, I set up um, eight-foot uh, pens on either side, and I decided that would be a good place to winter the flock because, you know, it, it, it is warmer inside that greenhouse. And so um, 
I'm not as far north as you are. Yeah. Uh, but we have we have some significant winter here. We're not Florida. Um, and so we have to deal with uh, the harshness of winter. And so I figured uh, I'd be giving my birds an edge by uh, putting them in the greenhouse. And I speculate that they benefited the greenhouse g- crops as well uh, with the body heat of up to 400 pounds of, of live bird. Yeah. And also the exhalations of uh, carbon dioxide, you know, plants take in carbon dioxide and expire oxygen. Um, and so, uh, yeah, chicken breath can be part of your <laughs> greenhouse <laughs> strategy. The secret sauce. And, uh, and I opened the uh, far end of the greenhouse uh, onto a what I call a winter feeding yard. And uh, it was deeply covered with uh, the kind of organic duff that uh, all sorts of organic uh, debris that you would use in uh, making a compost and let the birds work that through the winter and uh, come spring, uh, that was, they, they, had, they had turned all of that into something between uh, compost and a mulch. And uh, I was ready to start gardening again immediately on that area. Yeah. That, 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 that was what I was constantly striving for uh, with the flock, integrating everything into one uh, project as much as I could. And, and that's what I've stressed in the book. Yes. I, I, I love that idea of it just all working together. Um, so you weren't turning them loose because I, I plant with some winter crops in my greenhouse. We have a pretty big one. And I, I'll plant some spinach and greens and stuff in there. Um, so I'm trying to figure out how I could, you just said you had a pin, an eight foot pin in the end of your greenhouse. So they weren't roaming free range in there. No, they were two separate pins with uh, a four foot space between. And I, uh, had, uh, uh, therefore I put a four foot, um, door swinging gate, just light framing, uh, with chicken wire on it, and I put one of those doors on each of two separate pens with that four foot space between. Okay. So with that setup, either of those two doors could swing into blocking position to uh, to keep the chickens out of the greenhouse growing area. So yes, they they never had access to the uh, crops because lettuces kale spinach you yes. bet they would have oh man they would have uh <laughs> they, they would have snacked on those right away of course absolutely yes okay i think i could do something similar then so now i'm my wheels are turning i'm gonna have to go create a plan when we get off our <laughs> our interview and sketch it out but that would be awesome yeah um because it's definitely more pleasant in the greenhouse in the winter than anywhere else on the homestead oh yes <laughs> yes yes um so switching gears a little bit, I want to talk about predators because I think that's the bane of many homesteaders' existence with their birds. Um, and I know that we deal with we deal with raccoons. I think is our biggest issue. Um, and a lot of folks have anything from coyotes to bears to bobcats to foxes. Um, but I know that you talk a little bit about how the best offense against predators is the best defense. So tell us a little bit more about that. Well, let me start with this observation, uh, Jill. Um, uh, and, and in fact, in the revision, I expanded greatly. I started the chapter on predators by expanding greatly on what I said on the subject in the first edition about the, the discussion of predation, of predators, our thinking it through how to have a flock in the face of an ambient predator population. It starts with the appreciation of the role, the vital role in our uh, local ecology of predators. And I cite uh, the example where they brought rabbits in and the rabbits escaped and 
and uh, started multiplying like rabbits. Like they do. And uh, and. In a, in a whole continent where there were no natural predators to the, the rabbits. And they became, from the mid-1800s until today, Australia's unsolvable problem. So I, I start with suggesting the idea of, uh, um, think first and foremost, uh, what would I do? Uh, <laughs> It will just imagine if those guys weren't on the job in my local ecology in terms of explosion of uh, rabbit population, rodent populations, any number of insect species. So we start with an appreciation and respect for their role and their work uh, to balance the ecology. But a lot of those predators like a chicken dinner as yes, much as do. you and I do. Yeah. And so therefore, uh, yes, it, it comes down to the three uh, key strategies uh, to protect the flock, defense, defense, and defense. Um, and so, uh, you know, some people can totally free range their flock, at least in the day. Most, uh, most predators are nocturnal, and that gives us a bit of an advantage in dealing uh, in, in uh, setting up our defense. But uh, there are flocksters who are able to uh, allow their chickens to free range during the day and then shut them up tightly at night. Uh, but otherwise, you do need some fencing that will not only keep them where you want them to be, but, um, but keep the predators out. I like electric net fencing. Okay. Um, it's uh, really, really effective. Uh, but it, for really small flocks, like I have now, um, then uh, a static fence might be perfectly appropriate. That's what I have now, and uh, meaning a fence made with a uh, wire mesh dug into the ground to eight inches. And, <clears throat> and then I added, even to my small chicken run, uh, two additional defenses. One, uh, single-strand electric wire run around the base of the perimeter of the uh, fence uh, at three levels, something like, say, three, eight, and 12 inches, uh, with the idea that, you, that you're going to uh, increase the chance that a predator of any size is going to make contact with that sensitive nose yes. with one of those fence wires. And believe me, uh, it is that jolt of electricity uh, is has a tremendously deterrent effect. Ask me how I yes. know. <laughs> We've all done and, it at least once. And the <laughs> other, and the other uh, option is to <clears throat> put some kind of a block to aerial predators overhead. Now, if you go to, uh, you, you know, you can buy these. Uh, um, bird netting type uh, things, that, uh, uh, avian netting that you can uh, put overhead. But those, uh, some of those, those are, are pretty expensive. And the larger your, uh, the uh, run that you're trying to net, the uh, not only the more expensive, but the harder it is to going to be to uh, set it up in terms of uh, infrastructure, in terms of yeah. framing. And so I tried out something starting last year that I had often read about, but it uh, I, I, when I set up my uh, chicken run with its uh, exterior perimeter post, I added three additional posts in the middle, uh, in the interior of the run, and then put uh, small hooks uh, on the top of each post and ran from post to post in all sorts of diagonal runs uh, from, uh, you know, a, about, I don't know, a dozen different posts, something like that, uh, so that I had a monofilament fishing line strung from every post in every direction. And you can kind of picture that making a, yeah. a real, a, a real uh, kind of web or netting overhead, and last winter, there was a red 
tail hawk around here that uh, I that we that that I know for a fact made several successful hits on uh, flocks very close to my property, and I saw that guy numerous times. He'd sit on the limb of a tree and watch me as I worked in the chicken yard. Yep, and I I I never lost a single bird, and I and I am convinced that 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 uh, monofilament fish line net overhead is a very effective uh, barrier to deterrent to aerial predators. That's brilliant. I've not thought of that before. Um, we don't have a lot of aerial predators, but, we, but once, um, well, it was to keep the Icelandics in, once upon a time, I bought some of that avian netting and tried to put it over the top of our rather large run, and it was a disaster. Like, it could have been... A, a blooper of me tangled in the netting, trying to hang the netting. It was not, it, it was not good. So I like the fishing line better, a lot better. Much better oh, oh so. re- really? Uh, I, I do think that you should uh, set it up in terms of your number of um, the little hook mount points. Mm-hmm. S- set, set enough of those so that you, you have the option of a lot of individual strands from all angles so that you really do make a a denser uh, net or web uh, than if you have just a few mount points. Uh, But if you have enough of them and and you get a lot of webbing uh, up there as as the end result, uh, in my experience, this is, well, I started to say tremendously effective. In my experience so far, 100% effective. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. Hey friends, so I'm interrupting this episode for just a second because I'm sitting here with a giant box of beef on my lap. You may not be able to see this uh, unless you're watching the video version of the podcast. Uh, And it's very cold beef, might I add. But I don't know about you, but when the weather changes, it starts to get colder, I get this urge to stock up. I think it's like this primal human thing. I want my pantries full. I want my freezers full. I want to have the vegetables and the fruits squirreled away. And I want to have plenty of meat for the winter. Now, you guys know that I'm a huge proponent of you growing your own meat. I think that's one of the most rewarding things we can grow as homesteaders. However, I know that not everybody can grow their own beef or chicken or pork. And one of Christian and I's dreams for years has been to be able to provide really good beef to those of you who don't have the ability to grow it yourself. A couple of years ago, we launched Genuine Beef Company. You've maybe heard me talk about it before here on the podcast. And we are able to now provide... Wyoming raised grass finished beef to anyone in the continental United States. Uh, It's been amazing to see the boxes going out, super rewarding. But for this season, we put together a special stock up special to help you get your freezer full of good beef for your winter meals, the crock pot recipes, the stews, all that comfort food. So you go over to genuinebeefco.com. That's genuinebeefco.com and click on the banner at the top. You'll see the stock up special. It's a very, very low price. And we've thrown in two free pounds of ground beef. In addition to that ground beef, you're going to get two sirloin tip roasts. You're going to get four round steaks. You're going to get two pounds of stew meat. Um, And this is good stuff. These are our cattle. We don't ship them in from anybody else. This is the animals we raise right here on the Wyoming Prairie. So head on over to genuinebeefco.com. Check out the stock up special and give our beef a try. I can't wait to see what you think. Now back to our episode. Um, yeah, it's smart, super smart, and not expensive. I mean, we just had to mount it. The time mm-hmm. in and just no, setting it all up. No. But yeah, um, awesome, very cool. Um, okay, so I think one of my favorite parts of your first book was your chapters on feeding, because it was the first time I'd ever heard someone talk outside of the box, outside of the norm of how to feed a chicken that's not food from a, a chicken chow bag um, and you getting creative with natural feeds. Have you changed your thoughts on that at all since the first book or, or what are you feeding your chickens now? Um, I mentioned uh, in the first book, uh, the first edition, um, f- uh, the idea of feeding, feeding as a spectrum. And uh, I, the, I, the biggest difference is I just expanded on that idea and uh, 
and uh, give the reader, I think, a, a better uh, sense of the spectrum. And also, I hope, uh, I, I'm reassuring the reader, I don't want to create any guilt. You know, all of us are, are dependent to some extent, I think, on uh, uh, buying some feed. Um, and so I don't want the, 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 the flockster who is mostly reliant on, on the uh, manufactured feeds. I don't want that person to feel guilty that they're not doing more uh, to maximize uh, natural feeds. But I do try to, uh, I, uh, my idea, by the way, of the spectrum is, uh, on one end of the spectrum is, let's say, Tyson and Purdue. <laughs> yes, you know the yep. the the poultry industry, where the birds are totally confined and they never eat anything but what we offer them, which is these uh, highly processed manufactured feeds. And then on the other end is Gallus Gallus herself, that is the wild ancestor of uh, of our domestic chickens. Gallus Gallus domesticus, mm -hmm. um, but that wild ancestor obviously fed herself uh, with her own efforts out there foraging and hustling, hustling up her own grub. And so those are the two ends of the spectrum. And the idea I suggest is that we all find the sweet spot on the spectrum not for anybody else, not for any ideal definition of where it should be, but for us, for our flock, for our uh, nine to five, five days a week job, maybe, where we don't have as much time to put into it, or we have a smaller property or whatever. However, for every single flockster, so far as I can imagine, um, there are opportunities for giving the access, the, giving the birds access to more natural feeds, and the more natural feeds, the better. Um, and the more, and and even if even if the flock is being fed mostly the uh, manufactured feed, the more uh, natural feeds, even if a small portion, they tend to potentiate and to uh, boost the effectiveness of the uh, feed from the bag. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's a matter of finding our own space on that spectrum, but realizing that there are all these opportunities we probably never even thought of in the garden, on the lawn, in the landscape uh, that we can utilize to give the birds more access to the, uh, the natural feeds. What would be examples of some of those opportunities that we, maybe we haven't thought of yet? Well, I, we, we could start in that order. I, I mentioned garden, lawn, and landscape. Um, <clears throat> um, a lot of uh, people who are listening to us who have small flocks, they also grow a garden. And so uh, what do you do in a garden? You weed. <laughs> you weed. Yes. You do a lot of weeding. A lot of weeding. And so uh, when you're... When you're weeding, throw those weeds to the uh, to the flock and uh, let them, especially those who are confined to a uh, a chicken run, uh, throw those weeds in there. Also, uh, when we're thinning uh, crops, uh, you know, we start m more, we plant more seeds than we uh, expect to harvest because we want to thin to the strongest plants. So those thinnings, throw them to the birds. Spent crop plants, like uh, when you harvest that final uh, broccoli head, the green plant is still, uh, I mean, the plant is still green. Pull it out by the roots as you're getting ready for the next uh, uh, following crop and throw that greenery to the, uh, to the birds. The large outer wrapper leaves of uh, cabbages and lettuce, uh, they're, they're great feed. Um, you know, and, and a lot of plantings like cover crops or in a corner of the garden that you're not cropping, you can grow sunflowers mm, yeah. and, uh, 
and when those sunflower heads uh, mature their seeds, cut those off, feed them to the flock, and, uh, and then pull up the, the whole green plant with the green leaves and put them in the, uh, for, for, the, for the chickens and other uh, poultry such as ducks and geese. Ducks and geese just love sunflower leaves. Yeah. And then finally, um, I know I'm making a long list here, no, but there good is list. a long list. Keep it list. coming. It's good. Yeah. But, but, but uh, another one, and this is a huge uh, area of opportunity, I emphasize huge, and that is cover cropping. I think most car- gardeners yeah. don't do nearly as much uh, cover cropping as they could, as they should. <laughs> Yes, um, yes. and, and, and cover crops, even in small gardens, uh, you can find cover cropping opportunities even over winter. Well, maybe not where you are, <laughs> um, <laughs> sort of that, that, uh, that, um, you know, allow you with cover crops to be improving the soil and protecting the soil four seasons of the year. You don't ever have to have long periods where you've got bare soil. So if you're cover cropping a lot, and especially in winter, right now, my garden is, uh, with the exception of one bed that I have in uh, fall cover crops, my entire garden is covered with cover crops and they're cold hardy cover crops and so that means that in my mid-atlantic winter uh about every day of the winter i'm going to be able to cut fresh greenery to throw to the flock in a season of the year when you know there just isn't any greenery to be had from the landscape oh okay that was the garden (laughs) the uh, uh if you have a if you have a lawn, uh, you, you can feed uh, grass clippings to your bird. That's good green feed. Don't dump in big, thick layers of grass clippings. They will uh, uh, become, they will start rotting uh, and become putrid and molding, growing mold, and uh, constitute a real slick, slippery hazardous to walk on surface so just do sprinklings uh when you when you mow your lawn just just put a light uh sprinkling of uh of the grass clippings over the whole chicken run um that that will be really good feed for them and then finally the the landscape uh if you have a bit of pasture or if you have a little bit of a wood lot you can set up electric net uh electric net fencing and give your chickens uh, natural habitat areas to range in and find natural feeds like insects, grasshoppers, and field bugs, and uh, all kinds of green plants uh, to to feed on. Um, and uh, uh, that, there was one other, one other point here about uh, giving them access. Uh, Well, uh, oh, sorry. Um, okay, so um, I, I mentioned both pasture and a, and a bit of woodlot. Uh, if we're talking only about the pasture, then the possibility uh, presents itself of a mobile uh, chicken shelter, mobile yeah. poultry shelter, uh, that you can move to fresh grass as frequently as needed to keep the chickens, they're always scratching, from wearing and uh, damaging that sod. And uh, how often you have to move, of course, depends on the size of the shelter, the number of birds in it, and how long you leave it parked, and the point in the season. In the spring, the grass is regrowing, and or the sod is regenerating faster than it would in the dry parts of summer. But you learn all of that as, you know, you learn to, to get into a rhythm with all that. But a, a well-designed um, mobile shelter is a great option for giving your birds access to fresh grass, uh, and especially with a small flock. And did I say well, uh, well-designed? <laughs> in, yeah. the new bo- uh, in the new book, in the new book, I offer what I call 
the ultimate <laughs> mobile shelter. And uh, uh, if I sound like I'm bragging a little bit, sorry about that. All but, right. <laughs> uh, I'm not real. I'm not really bragging about my own contribution to that project so much as having found um, a, a product that's uh, called uh, a wheel lift kit. It's a piece of hardware that you can buy, and there are home um, homemade versions you could make of your own if you're handy, but a wheel lift kit that you can mount on even a quite substantial mobile shelter up to 400 pounds oh. and very e very easily get that thing within seconds up on wheels in the back ready to roll and then in the front lift with a long uh, like a handlebar on a, on a pivot and two additional wheels and once you get that thing up on its wheels it'll roll like a Cadillac that is intriguing I'm gonna have to go check that part of the book out because we have a chicken, a mobile chicken shelter, but um, well, I mean, I know Joel Salatin has his designs that he's very particular about, and we tried to follow his, but we live where it's very windy, so we have to build everything for like hurricane winds, basically. So ours is heavy, and I can drag it, but man, I have to like brace myself and like really <coughs> work at it. I'm like, it's a good workout. It's a good workout. That's what I tell myself. Um, but wheels, <laughs> that's intriguing. The wheels sound nice. <laughs> Jill, uh, you know, I see all these designs for uh, a uh, mobile shelter that are just feather light and you yeah. can you, you can move them with a pinky, yes. but so can the wind, so can the as wind. you know. <laughs> yeah. And 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 so uh, I'm with you. I like a nice, heavy, substantial shelter. Uh, and that's really great for those strong winds. But the disadvantage is uh, getting it moved. And, and the harder it is to move, the more you're going to be inhibited from, yeah. making a, from, from moving that as often as you should for the sake of the sod and the sake of the birds. Yep. And uh, so the, the solution uh, for me really was uh, the discovery of this, uh, this uh, piece of hardware, wheel lift kit, and... Um, and it just it just totally changed that picture. And moves were really, really quick and easy after that. That's a fantastic. Okay, I think everyone's going to be checking that out, that part of the book out, because that's a common <laughs> homesteader problem. Love when we solve those problems. Um, yeah, so fascinating. I love that you you bring the cover crops into it. I've, I've been getting more and more into cover crops the last few years. And mine don't grow necessarily through the winter like maybe yours do. So I can't keep trimming them and feeding them. Um, but like right now I have a bunch started. They're a couple inches tall in my garden beds and we'll get a good couple months of growth and then they'll stop when it gets really cold and then they'll pick back up in the spring. So um, I love though, if, if someone's listening and they well, live in a, a nicer climate that maybe they could use those as feed. That's fantastic. But even in a <clears throat> colder climate, like yours, um, even if you get a couple of months uh, of production from the cold, hardy cover crops, you, you, yeah. maybe you can't go anywhere near all the way through the winter. But if you can get a, a month or two additional of fresh, high-quality green feed, that's a bonus. And, of course, it's a bonus on cover cropping you really want to do for the soil improvement anyway. And you did mention, I believe, that you have a greenhouse. I do, yes, yes. Yeah, and so uh, growing, um, growing some green feed in the greenhouse. Of course, it can't can't compete too much with your own family's need for uh, vegetable produce from your greenhouse. Mm -hmm. But you may uh, discover some options for squeezing in a little bit of production of. Uh, green plants uh, in the winter uh, for even if it's, for example, nursery trays uh, with small grains uh, or uh, uh, the, the uh, brassica type uh, seeds yeah. like kale and rape um, and mustards. Uh, you, you, all of those could be uh, grown in 
uh, greenhouse trays may be suspended from the the purlins of the greenhouse uh, to feed feed the flock in the winter. So uh, a greenhouse gives you, I'm sure as you've discovered, lots and lots of options for growing, but uh, consider what you can do for the flock as well. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, Yeah, that's a great idea. I have all kinds of new ideas to work on (laughs) from this interview. I love it. Um, Okay, so switching gears just slightly again, um, I want to talk for a minute about chicks and immunity because i know you have some really interesting thoughts around this and i know there's the school of thought that says you bring home the chicks and you sterilize everything to death and you put them in this very clean environment and then you have a little bit of a different perspective can you speak to that for a minute um yes um and of course this you you know we're talking about chicks and a brooder now but uh that 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 topic kind of turns into the topic of deep litter when when the birds become adults. But you're you're right. Uh, there there has been this conventional idea that we have to make really heroic efforts to ensure sterility, as if you could. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. In the brooder, sterility. Sterility. Uh, what are we going to do? Bring on blow torches? Uh, gallons of bleach, mm. what's really being proposed here. Um, but but the conventional wisdom is uh, that, that when you clear the brooder of a batch of chicks, you clean that out yeah. and you use some bleach and you scrub. And, and uh, you know, in the 1940s, uh, they did experiments in uh, the Ohio Extension Services and they, they in, in these big uh, houses with lo- uh, many, many hundreds of chickens, uh, of chicks, in a large brooder, uh, they experimented with not cleaning out the brooder between batches, but just topping off and renewing the, uh, the absorbent litter, uh, wood shavings, for example, as needed when things get nasty you don't you don't rake it all out but instead just keep adding on uh fresh layers of that absorbent high carbon uh litter and then you then you spend hours working it in right no of course not the chicks do that and it's fun for them it gives them something to do in lieu of the the stress uh, and boredom of not having any any activity, yeah. um, and then and and believe me, I've been in I have been in touch with uh, correspondents in the American Pastured Poultry Producers Association, who who affirm that wisdom that oh yes, we never clean out between uh, brooder batches. Mm-hmm. We just allow that biological decompositional activity that has been established by working the poops in with that high carbon decomposable literature, uh, 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 litter. Um, we, we just capitalize on the fact that all that yeah. decompositional activity has started, all that biological microbial activity. And we capitalize on it by just adding fresh litter and bringing in the next uh, batch. And guess what? Batch two does better than batch one. Mm, yeah, yeah. And uh, I I heard uh, a presentation by Justin Rhodes recently in which he talked about uh, building up um, the deep litter and the brooders successfully for successively for two years and it, and it, until it's eighteen inches deep. Yeah. But it's biologically alive. Trust that. Yes. Don't fear that. Yes. I think that trust issue, that, that piece of trust is, is really important. And I think that in our modern paradigms, we're taught to not trust those biological processes so much. And it's really feels like you're jumping off a cliff when you decide to go counter to that. But um, man, it's, it's amazing Jill. how it works together. Jill. <laughs> Fear sells products. It does. It totally <laughs> and does. And if you if you can 
if if the manufacturers of products can get us to be afraid, then we'll buy their solutions. Yes, you nailed <laughs> and it. And if you if you go with if you go with natural processes in which there's no profit. Uh, nobody's going to tell you, or very few people, uh, no, nobody in the in the corporate world is going to tell you to to adopt those solutions. But it's the natural solutions, the cheap or free solutions, that uh, we should learn to work with and trust. Yes, yes absolutely. Uh, yes, the magic is there. Um, the magic is there. I is. like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So we have covered some awesome ground. I'm trying to think if there's any other questions that I had. Is there anything you'd want to add to the audience who's listening and watching? Uh, one thing that I uh, emphasized a lot in the book is uh, breeding uh, hmm. your, your own stock, even at what I call the ambitious homestead or s small farm scale. And uh, it's... You know, it's easy just to let the cock mate the hen and get fertile eggs and put them under, uh, put them in an incubator or under a broody hen and get stock. But free for all matings are not really the way to go if we want to breed for improvement. And so I'll, I'll, I added quite a bit in the book about uh, new information about breeding. Um, and that I, there's one chapter I call "Trap Nest and Hatchet" mm. <laughs> to 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 kind of sim to kind of uh, uh, point to the two essentials in a breeding program: selection and culling. A rigorous culling—that's the hatchet part. Okay. A lot of culling, a lot of culling, keeping only the few best for to use as breeders. But on the selection side. Um, there are a lot of aspects to selection, but the most essential tool for, uh, for, for making wise selections is determining which hen laid this specific egg. And you can't do that yeah. without trap nest. Very and true. so I, I did, um, uh, include in the new edition a step-by-step uh, -step, uh, description of uh, both the design concepts and the uh, construction of what I consider really the best uh, design for a trap nest I have ever tried. And uh, after working with it, I think I got it to about a state of 100% uh, uh, functionality. And uh, so if you're interested in breeding, Ah, uh, you really should be be nest trapping, yes. And you sh really should be using a good, reliable design, and that's described in this book. Awesome. Yes, I think that's. I know that's one aspect that I don't think a lot of homesteaders have broached into quite yet. Uh, breeding their own stock, and then especially getting specific about that. So I think that's an area where all, a lot of us could stand to improve. Um, I hope. I hope so. I hope so. I hope that this. I hope that this book will inspire more people to uh, to at least entertain the idea that they they can. They, this is within their grasp. Grasp. They can do that, and to suggest some uh, some principles and some management uh, routines that are really really come down to being pretty simple, and not too big a burden on management time which is a big bonus because we ha we all have a lot of irons in the fire i know so the, the simpler <laughs> we can make it then we're more prone to do it are you breeding your own meat birds as well uh no i never bred uh well uh, let me say this jill uh, that after a certain point uh, you know when, when i was breeding most of my own stock i i didn't breed meat birds uh, as a class mm. per se any longer. In other words, Cornish cross or something, uh, these yeah. big, clunky, fast-growing meat hybrids. I no longer did that after a certain time okay. because I was breeding my own stock. And, and par as I said, part of the, the breeding 
is uh, rigorous calling, uh, calling of the many, calling of the many to select the uh, the best superior few. So if you're doing that, you're calling a lot of birds, right? You're killing a lot of birds. Yeah. Those those were meat birds on, on, at at our place. From that point on, no longer raised meat birds, but instead. Any bird that needed to be called at whatever age, that was a meat bird. <laughs> I like that model. And, and, that, yeah. and that worked very well for us um, uh, because, you know, when people raise meat birds, they're always getting the same thing, either a fast-growing broiler or if they raise it to a big, chunky roaster. It, it's always, that's the only thing, that, you know, that, that you're going to end up with. But when you're, when you're ca calling successively through the season, excess young males, uh, aging females, uh, breeding cocks that are no longer, uh, you know, that have passed their, their time in the breeding uh, program, um, you know, that kind of throughout the year breed, uh, uh, calling, those are your meat birds. Yep. And that's a much more sustainable <laughs> and, and so, system that it feels like. Right. And uh, and also what you find that when you're uh, culling birds at all different stages of life, that opens up uh, a, a lot of uh, culinary <laughs> possibilities. Yeah. Yeah. The young, young tender birds in the spring, nice for baking or frying or broiling. And then the... Uh, the cockerels that are not real old cocks, but they, they've toughened up some. They're nice for a braised dish like cock au vin. And then old birds, I don't think so much in terms of uh, eating those, but uh, making broth with them, the best broth wow. in the yes. world. And you can eat, you eat the meat as well, yeah. But the big payoff is this fabulous broth. Yes, absolutely. All the all the nutrients in there. Um, yeah, I love I love that way of thinking about it. Yeah. Wow. Um, I have so many ideas floating around. Thank you so much for this. <laughs> um, fantastic. I, I encourage anyone listening or watching, go grab Harvey's book. Um, it has been both. I have both editions now. I know the first edition has been invaluable to me. You've probably heard me talk about it before. I can't wait to dive in deeper to the second edition. Um, Harvey, where can folks find you if they want to um, learn more about you or, or keep up with what you're doing? First, uh, Jill, about the book, uh, you know, on, on the first edition, uh, contra my preferences, my publisher put a picture of, of this mug oh, on yes. the cover. Yes, yes. And then in the, in the second edition, I thought they made a lot better choice. They, they put somebody on the cover a lot better looking than me. I thought both covers were very nice. I know. I, I think they're both great. <laughs> but it is a so, lovely cover. Uh, yes. we, were, we, we were talking about Icelandics earlier. That's one of my Icelandic hens. Okay. She's anyway, gorgeous. Anyway, anyway, where you can uh, uh, get in touch with me as, is at my website, themodernhomestead.u. Yes. Okay. And that website is is just a library of uh, different articles on gardening and uh, poultry and, and other homesteading pro uh, projects, uh, topics. Um, it's just a library of well over 200 pages of information that I was uh, wanted to share based on uh, our experience uh, working with our homestead here. Fabulous. Um, yes, I know you have a lot of good stuff over there. So friends, check out the book, check out the website. Um, Harvey, thank you again so much for coming on. You are brilliant. And this was a privilege to get to finally chat with you face to face after all these years. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, opportunity, and I enjoyed it too. I had a great time with this conversation. Thank you.